Hello, my name is Sharbani Das Gupta, and I'm deeply honored today to be able to introduce my teachers, mentors, and now my friends as well, I think, <laughs> Ray, Raymaker and Deborah Smith, to all of you. I now live in Las Cruces, but I was a student with them many, many years ago, almost two and a half decades ago, and their influence on my life and what I am today um, has been phenomenal, and I would like to share a little bit of their story with you, of what they would, and you know, bits that I know about their story. And maybe at the end they can add in a few details if I've missed something. Um, Golden Bridge Pottery, which was founded by Ray and Deborah Meeker, is in Pondicherry. And I made my way there in 1991, very early in the morning one day. And it looked, it looks like this. In the midst of India, it's like an oasis of calm, um, green. There's a murmur of workers and trees. And um, it's, you know, there's, it, it has its own tempo. There's a smell of wet clay and washed brick. It's a quiet universe with a quiet order and a unique rhythm. For many of us who've been students there, it's been a sanctuary and a place of discovery and learning, and we've spent untold hours under its sloping roofs. But despite its timelessness in our memories, Golden Bridge Pottery that I know didn't look like this always. Before its present avatar of sloping tiled roofs, it was a simple bamboo shed with a thatched roof. Deborah and Raymaker had met as students of ceramics in Susan Peterson's studio in USC in 1969. Deborah was a graduate of um, Japanese from Stanford, and Ray was an architectural student who had decided to shift to ceramics. In 1970, after Deborah had traveled to Japan with uh, Susan Peterson to help as an interpreter for her book on Shoji Hamada, she came across the teachings of Sri Aurobindo, and when her time in Japan was done, she found her way to Pondicherry, which is in coastal South India. And once she was there at the ashram, she was asked to um, make a clay studio to build a pottery. She agreed on the grounds that Ray would agree to come and build a kiln for her. These are somewhat the words she tells us. Ray at the time was traveling in Europe, but decided to come to Pondicherry and build a, build a kiln. He thought that it was going to be a short stint, but 47 years later, luckily for us, they're still there. I think I'm going to fast. Initially, the pots were all produced by Ray and Deborah, but over time, the pottery became Deborah's domain. No, no, I'm going backwards, sorry. Yeah. And um, she trained the local workers to throw, but every pot herself was decorated by herself. And you know, her, her exhaustive notes, kiln loading plans, handwritten labels for each and every pot, these are all just a glimpse into her meticulous detail, um, a meticulous attention to detail. The wood-fired stone fire, stoneware pottery that she produced became synonymous with Pondicherry. And although it was called Golden Bridge Pottery or GBP Pottery as we call it, it has also become known as Pondicherry Pottery. Her signature blue and white cobalt oxide brushwork is something that's coveted and it's always in high demand and always back ordered. <coughs> the elegant forms are a classic mistake, not mistake, mixture of restraint and liveliness. The work became so well known, in fact, that even the flagship airline of India, Air India, used, used it as a poster theme to advertise Pondicherry as a tourist destination. With the pottery now firmly in Deborah's control, Ray decided to work on other areas of his interest. 
he uh, came across the workshops of Nader Khalili's adobe building and wanted to experiment with firing the adobe houses in situ. This monumental journey became the subject of a PhD thesis by the architect Anupama Kundu, and this was translated into a book, Building with Fire, which is due to be re released this year. Ray thought that by developing an architectural process of building and firing with materials found on site, he could create a viable, low-cost building technology for India. The houses would become the kilns themselves and would be stacked with clay products, furniture, tiles that could then be used to finish and furnish the houses. The firings themselves carry on for days. It is a massive feat in the heat of the South Indian summers, racing to finish and fire before the monsoons come in. This was also around the time that I first came to Pondicherry. And he was in the middle of building a house in Oroville, and I was told to wait for him to come, so I helped load many of those tiles on bullock carts, which, would, which went out, and it was more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's really, really hot. And I think that's why he allowed me to become a student the next year. That's good. I was told that that's why he approved my <laughs> application. And the results are really beautiful. These, these homes are still occupied. Their interiors are serene, cool, idyllic. It's, it's hard to find spaces like this in modern India. He built sing single homes, complexes, and even a temple for an Indian classical dance school in Bangalore. But though the demand is high, was high, still is high, he discontinued making them because of the sheer intensity of the labor required and the skill that was needed. In the meantime, Ray's own personal sculpture was also evolving. His themes revolve around the, in, in the environment and the toll taken by human activity. Um, the, first, the first piece is called Kurukshetra, which is a reference to the name of the battlefield in one of the Indian epic stories. His work has grown in scale, and he, has, he is known both for the monumental ca character of his sculpture and for its earthy physicality. And if this wasn't enough, Ray also started taking in students each year from 1984 onwards, a handful of about four or five each year. We would learn from scratch, from making clay to throwing. We don't get boxed clay in India, so we have to you know, actually mix everything by hand. There are no pug mills, nothing. We, we learned everything. Formulating clays, firing, packing the kiln, by the time we leave from the, from the pottery, we do know how to handle clay. And there are many long months immersed in the pottery, also leads to deep friendships, many hours of conversation, and a continuing lifelong association with the students. Most of Ray's students are now practicing artists at the forefront of ceramic arts in India. In 2013, they, were, they and several of their former students were part of a delegation of 17 Indian contemporary ceramic artists who, went to, who were invited to China, to Fule, to make work for the contemporary Indian clay museum they were starting. In 2010, Ray was commissioned to design and create a clay sculpture garden for the Hyatt Hotel in Chennai. Like all of Ray's undertakings, this too would be massive in scale. His final piece, The Passage, stands finished at 21 feet high. The size of the project was so vast that he decided to rope in other artists as well. As well. It allowed him to offer many of his former students and his colleagues the opportunity to work at a scale that they had not tried before. These are some of the pieces from the gardens. Mi Michelle Hutton, Deborah Smith, um, Rakhi Kane, Arti Veer. First one is myself, then there's Ashwini Bhatt and Antra Sena. Along with, along with working with his students, working on current projects in India, Golden Bridge, Ray and Deborah have supported bringing in 
many of the well-known artists from around the world to come and do workshops and work with their students. These are images from workshops with Betty Woodman and Susan Peterson. Others too have come, Tim Rowan, um, Mike Dodd, Sandy Brown, and Jeff Shapiro. These are just to name a few. Many more have come over the years. Today, their ground floor, the ground floor of their colonial home in the French part of Pondicherry has been converted into a museum of the ceramic arts and they plan to uh, develop it into a future resource center. We don't really have any museum like this in India anywhere else, which is dedicated entirely to the ceramic arts. The legacy is so great that really I don't have the words to describe all of it. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for doing all this and for being there and being part of our lives in India. Pondicherry isn't any longer the sleepy coastal town that they once knew, but if a person is known for what they leave for others, there are very few who have had the reach and impact of these two once Californian dreamers. I'd like to thank the NSICA for recognizing their extraordinary achievement, and I want to ask you both to please come and say a word as well. Please, you've come all the way from India. I'm sure we would like to hear from you. world's worst speaker <laughs> you know I, I what I what I what we've done I did without speaking very much uh, but anyway it's been it's been uh, an ex obviously it's been an extraordinary experience and uh, what I like to say is that what uh, what we have given to the students and is far out you know, that is outweighed by what the students have given back to us. What the students gave to us was India. Without having, without teaching, we would never have uh, really known, you know, we would have been down in the south, pretty isolated. But having the students coming from all over the country, we learned about the greatness of the country. Thank you very much.